This is News Talk 95.1 FM, 790 AM KFYO, and we're going to go directly to the phones. We've got uh, Dr. Skuvenik on the line. Dr. Skuvenik, how are you doing today? Good morning. Is that, that's you, Matt, right? That's me. I'm Matt, uh, and Dave's on the line as well. Okay. Good morning, Dr. Skuvenik. Good morning, Dave. Uh, how are you doing? I, I, I'm doing okay. My kids are going crazy, uh, but other than that, we're good. Right. Yeah, I'm a... I'm having a tough time dealing with this uh, this quarantine thing. Uh, uh, it's hard for me to sit still. How about you, Dr. Skuvin? Um, it, I think it's difficult for everybody. It's very odd. It's almost surreal. Um, and I think we still have a ways to go. So let's see. Let's see how we are next month. So, Dr. Skuvin, uh, we did we did have get one question for you from. Uh, uh, the um, the text line, and I just wanted to get this out there because um, uh, what what happened is apparently they they got a bill from Texas Tech, um, and they're like, well, what are we supposed to do with bills? You know, other people are are you know pulling back on that. If they don't have the money to pay their bill, or if they're having problems and they received a bill mm -hmm. from Texas Tech, who do they call about that? And um, uh, how how do they uh, get some help with that? Maybe okay. Um you know, this could be a bill for tuition. That was still outstanding. <clears throat> right, and I think that's what they said it was or something yeah. similar. And and so um, I, I would recommend that they call um, Student Business Services, the Office of Financial Aid. Uh, I'll speak, we have delayed uh, some of the tr uh, billing that we usually do. Uh, we try to be very sensitive to this. And, and also, if they just want to write to me, I'll get in touch with Noelle Sloan, our CFO, because I know her and Martin Bradley are working this on a daily basis. And, and Matt, um, to that point, um, we have we've done a lot to try to lessen some of the financial problems that people are facing. For instance, this week, um, we're going to announce that Summer One will be um, online. At the same time, we're not going to charge the typical online learning and distance fee. Uh, we're going to reduce the service fees we usually charge uh, by 50%. And um, also this week, we're going to be announcing that the Red Raider Guarantee, which provides um, free tuition to families that have an adjusted gross income under $40,000, we are going to increase that to $65,000. Wow. And... and um, you know, that decision on the fees, uh, that, that's, that's almost $7 million right there. That's what I was going to say. How much is, is uh, all this costing Texas Tech? Well, for instance, when we announced that we would give a prorated refund of the housing, that was a bit over $7 million. The, the uh, decision to give credit for the dining dollars that were stir, still out there, that was a bit over 4 and it just goes on like that. Um, I, I feel a bit awkward and even discussing the finances because right now that's not our, you know, we're, we're going to do everything we can to keep people safe, to help them. But that's the reality we're dealing with, you know, behind the scenes. Well, and on top but, of that, I mean, you can't really put numbers on everything because it's not over yet. You really don't know how, how big it's going to really affect Texas Tech. And uh, I do have a question. Is Texas Tech worried a little bit about uh, the oil and gas prices? I know that the state of Texas um, uh, puts a lot of money into the colleges, and a lot of that comes from oil and gas. Well, for, for instance, um, there are preliminary discussions about what may happen in the coming uh, session. And we're looking at scenarios of anywhere from 25 to 5% cuts. Uh, I don't want to alarm people at tech um, in saying that, but that's the reality we're going to have to deal with. Uh, we're compiling a list of the additional costs and loss of revenue that have resulted from COVID-19. And conservative, conservatively, right now, it's in excess of $35 million. We hope to get some uh, relief from the CARES Act, you know, the Coronavirus Aid and Relief Economic Security Act, that President Trump signed. We'll also be seeking support from the Texas Department of Emergency Management and from FEMA. We don't know what we'll get there, but um, we hope to get some relief uh, beyond what we'll... And, and our reserves are good. Noel Sloan has done a fabulous job of helping us manage the financial issues here. Okay. Yeah. So... so um, well, no. Oh, go ahead, Dave. 
uh, let me, uh, Mr. President, let me ask you. Uh, we have a texture that says, when will the new graduation be? Just a senior wanting to know when I get to walk down the aisle on the stage. Okay, that, I'm, great you, I'm, I'm glad they asked. We are going to announce this week, today I, I, I want that memo to go out late this afternoon after the faculty senate meeting, that we will be, going, we will be offering a pass-fail option to students. And because of that, we're going to have to move the virtual um, graduation ceremony to May 23rd. And so um, the virtual ceremony, and I've said this before, um, is, is going to be um, it's going to be, I think, better than people might expect. You're, you're going to have messages from the chancellor, the board. I'll speak. Uh, we. Um, we have we're going to have a very special person making an announcement. I, I have to hold off on saying who that is. And, oh, now go, uh, go it'll, ahead. It'll let's, let's make let's make some news here. Go ahead. And oh, tell us. I could get in big trouble if I if this person would renege <laughs> on the preliminary conversation. Um, so this, Dave, I'll be the first. I'll call you when I know for a fact. Um, <laughs> and uh, there will be an opportunity for students to issue messages, as their name is called and such. So that's May 23rd. And then um, – Keep it clean, gonna, though, right? I'm sorry? Keep yeah. it clean, though, right? Uh, I'm a bit worried about some of that. Um, <laughs> uh, at least we won't have the dancing. Um, yeah. <laughs> the uh, – uh, and then we're going to allow the students to walk uh, in, in August. But, you know, then we don't know for certain that August will be the time that we can have our first in-person graduation. And then Kirby Holcutt and I have visited, and we're going to have all the students, all those graduates, come down onto the field. We'll be playing pop and circumstance as they come onto the field at halftime, and we'll recognize them at one of our football games. That's another issue where the scheduling isn't completely known at this time. Man, I hope they get football open because uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of bored right now. You know, we need some sports. Uh, yeah, you, uh, you, you know, um, yeah, there's so many you, things. You know, uh, I think. Go ahead, Dave. Oh no, I'm sorry. Uh, go go ahead with your answer there. Well, uh, speaking of sports, um, um, we had a board meeting this week as we continued to discuss with the Big Twelve Board of Directors just what we're going to do with uh, fall sports. Uh, the Autonomy Five conferences have been in discussion about what alternative schedules would be considered. But the reality is we must have football. It's so essential to our budget. And so everything's on the table. Um, you know, we may be playing football in March and April, not just me saying that, but we need uh, to have football, and, and we're going to keep every option open. Yeah. Well, Mr. President, speaking of that, uh, first off, I am one of these who is in favor of getting this economy back open, for one thing. The sooner the better. But I do believe, and as uh, many people have said, many experts, that we're going to be living in a new reality when we do that. Uh, probably until such time that we have a vaccine for this thing. But I'm wondering if you can look in your crystal ball and imagine reopening this economy, how it's going to affect large gatherings like football games. And uh, um, Yeah, that's a good are... point, Dave. Right. In fact, that was discussed. That was brought up at the board meeting, the Big 12 board meeting this week. And um, – uh, I, I made kind of a flippant comment that, well, they, they were saying if, if we're going to play games maybe in, in front of empty stadiums, I thought, well, some of those bowl games that we've had in the past have given us a model for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like that, did they? <laughs> uh, everybody's short on humor these days. Uh. <laughs> um, but but we may have to consider um, – that's a very good point. I, it's going to be the state and the leadership at, at the high levels that will say when it's safe to get together. And even if we can relax the restrictions under which we live, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to gather in groups of 50,000 and such. So yeah. uh, it could mean a very different scenario as to how we, um, how we re-engage in athletics. Yeah. We'll just have but to wait and see. You, do you see football going off right now? Do you see it? 
it going off as scheduled in uh, uh, late August or September? So, Dave, um, I talk to Kirby almost every day, and the one thing we end up saying is we just don't know. I, I, I don't think any of us can look forward uh, to what may be happening in September and October. Um, this has been such a fluid, changing situation, and I think we've all seen the projections that this might peak in uh, mid-summer, depending on how social distancing works. So for me to even conjecture as to what would happen, I think, would be a little bit reckless. But, But we're looking at all options. I think we have to think outside the box. We need to have a football season. Um, It it accounts for such a large percentage of our athletic revenue. And um, I think also, to to your point about the economy and getting back to normal, we all need that. Um, But there are many smarter people than me thinking about how and when that's going to happen. Okay, Dr. Skivenek, we have to take a break right here. Um, but when we come back, um, I'd like you to explain what's going on with the dorms. I know people are coming in to get their stuff out, but you'll have all that spread out. Okay, um, Matt. All right, but but we'll be back right after these messages. All right, uh, Dr. Skivenek, uh, before... Before the break, like I was saying, I know that Texas Tech's going through a lot of changes right now. One thing is uh, that the students are having to come back to the dorms to get their stuff. How, how is that going to work? So, uh, Matt, uh, we had about 8,500 students living in the dorms. And as of Monday, um, I was told we had 267 students still in the dorms, those who have no place to go. Um, we began to implement a move-out process, and what we had to do is uh, provide a schedule so we would respect the so- social distancing and minimal contact with the staff. And I believe about um, three-quarters of the students that had mature, uh, stuff there has been um, removed. They-, they have until May 15th to move um, their personal belongings out of the dorm. So that's been progressing fairly smoothly. Um, We we do still run our dining services. Um, We have one location that you can pre-order, you pick up. Um, They're providing services to those that are in self-isolation. And we're also taking a, a meal a week out to the the BSL-3 laboratory at the Institute for Environmental and Human uh, Health, they've been working um, crazy schedules to do all the testing for the samples that are uh, brought in. They were the first BSL-3 lab that was authorized to test for the coronavirus. Now there are many, many locations around the state. What they've done out there has been extraordinary. Uh, So the students, um, the move out, has proceeded fairly smoothly. Um, how is everything going with distance learning? I know that a lot of the teachers have been uh, trained on that, but some of them may not have been. Um, has there been any issues as far as that's concerned? Yeah, that's, I'm glad you raised that, Matt. The transition to online instruction has gone fairly well, um, not perfect. Um, so I don't want to sound like Charlie Brown's teacher and throw out a bunch of numbers here, but um, – we teach about 500,000 student credit hours in a semester, and about 20% of that was already online. But to transition from 20% to 100% in a matter of two weeks is a massive task. Uh, it's gone better than I thought it would. Um, we have a lot of support services. I was told earlier this week they're getting about 100 calls a day from faculty dealing with issues. Um, one of the biggest issues we had to address, what about those students that don't have a computer or don't have access to the Internet? We acquired about 300 to 400 computers that we made available to students. If they're in an area where they didn't have a connection to the Internet, we provided a hot spot. That has gone fairly well. And as I mentioned, summer one will be that way. But at the same time, what this has showed me is you'll never replace the traditional residential experience, the face-to-face interactions. I've always um, learned better that way. Uh, yes, and and I, I suspect there's a lot of difference in what some students are uh, 
finding and others. But uh, my wife teaches from home, and uh, I listen to her teach, and she's interacting with them. She's writing on an iPad, and they can write as well. Okay. And well, actually, I've been quite impressed. She's a very good teacher. She She's so sweet to those students. Okay. I don't know what happens when she Sorry, deals with them. Sorry, Dr. Skivnick, <laughs> we're going to have to cut you off, but thank you. We'll be right uh, Okay.